So you found the perfect house, you don't want to lose it, and there's multiple offers on it. Of course there's multiple offers. I think there's multiple offers on like every single house available. The average house right now gets about four offers, and a lot of them have like 20 to 30 offers. <laughs> don't panic, you can win. I've won a ridiculous amount of multiple offer situations and I've generated thousands of offers for the people I've helped sell homes. So I see a lot of offers, I write a lot of offers, and I know what to do, what to say, and what it takes to actually win these things. So in this video, I'll tell you exactly what to do, what to say, and what to put into your offer to win the home of your dreams. And no, you don't have to be the highest offer. That's a myth. And if you stay to the end of this, I'll share some very rarely used tactics that can really tip the scales in your favor if it's, you know, neck and neck, apples to apples, but just make your apple a little bit better. How do you like them apples? Does that sound good? Great. Let's go. So if you're new here and new to me, my name is Paul and I make videos about all sorts of cities and towns all over Metro Detroit, Michigan, but I also give buyers and sellers tips on how to win offers and how to sell your house for more money. So if you're into that sort of thing, you should subscribe because there's a good chance I'm gonna cover some of the stuff that you're interested in or will be interested in if you ever want to buy or sell a house in Michigan or anywhere. Reach out because I'm also a full-time real estate agent and I've helped hundreds and hundreds of people buy and sell homes all over Metro Detroit and there's a good chance I can help you too. That's my website. You just go there and you can find me on the interwebs. All right, so let's get into this. I'm gonna use a risk scale of one to five one being least risky, and five being the most risky of things that you can do to add to your offer to win the house that you want, because that's the name of the game, right? Win the multiple offer situation, get the house, live there forever, the home of your dreams. I wanna live here forever. <laughs> so like, one is not risky at all, five is like danger zone, like, I went to the danger zone. Or you're already there. You're like already in the danger zone because you've already passed one through four. All right, so the first thing is be ready. This is like a negative one on the risk scale. I can't believe I even have to say this. Now, when I say be ready, I mean have a pre-approval in hand, not a pre-qualification, a pre-approval. Again, I can't believe I even have to say it. It's like if I gave you a step-by-step -step guide to running and I have to tell you to put on your shoes or tie your shoes first. I mean, it's what you need to do. Yeah, I know some people run barefoot. We're not talking about that. Take off my shoes and run home barefoot. Don't get into that with me. All right, so you're gonna want a pre-approval, not a pre-qualification. The difference between the two is a pre-approval. They actually check all of your stuff. A pre-qualification, it's like an automated thing. They just take your word for it. You say like, I make a million dollars a year. And they go, great, you can afford this. Yeah. A lot of real estate agents, including me, we won't even take pre-qualifications. We want pre-approvals only. There is literally nothing worse than finding the home of your dreams and then wanting to put an offer on it and they say, well, you can't put an offer on it because you don't have a pre-approval. No one's going to just take your word for it that you can afford a house. You have to have that set up first. Sellers are only going to take your offer seriously if you have financing in order. I see offers come through all the time. They're like, well, they'll get their pre-approval. Well, they should have already had their pre-approval. That's my reaction. Next thing is put more money down. This is like a one on the risk scale. If you're buying a house, you're already putting money down. If you have money saved, put more of it down. If you have 20% saved to put down towards a house, now is not the time to say, well, we'll only put 5% in our offer and we're going to save the rest to do renovations to the house. A multiple offer situation is not the time to do anything like that. Sellers and seller's agents like to see strong offers. 20% down or more is strong. 5% down is not strong. If you're a 5% down buyer, and you're up against a 20% down buyer and your offer is equal in monetary value, you lose if you're the 5% down buyer. You putting more money down means that you are more likely to close and there's less risk to the bank. The bank loaning you 80% of the loan is better than them loaning you 95% of the loan or 100% of the loan if you're a zero down buyer. I talk about how to buy a house with zero down. I'll link it right here. Watch it after. Don't 
watch it right now, but being a zero down buyer does not put you in a good position if you're up against people with 20%, 50%, 15%, even 10%. If you're zero down, you don't have the best chance. Next up is free possession. So possession is the time after closing if a seller needs to stay in the home. Sometimes that can go a long way. And I'm gonna say that this is a three on the risk scale because you are putting your money up for the seller to stay there. So the typical purchase takes about 30 days to close, sometimes less, sometimes a little more. So that's the day that the house becomes yours. So sometimes sellers are more concerned with that time after the fact. So after that closing date, they don't have a place to go. There's nowhere to go. And they want to be able to stay in their home. So sometimes it's more important to the seller to have a little bit of extra time after the fact to stay in the house. It's worth more to them than an extra five or $10,000 on an offer. You should have your real estate agent reach out to the other agent and find out what is important to the seller. I cannot tell you the number of times a seller's agent will shoot an offer over to me without even consulting me, without even saying, hey, what's important to your seller? Because, hey, they're trying to buy my seller's house. Sometimes a month of free possession or possession at all will go a long way with a seller. In situations where it's paid possession, the seller is essentially paying a daily rate to stay there. Every day they stay past closing, they pay a daily rate. Money is held out from the seller at closing and it covers your new mortgage. Free possession is free. They get to stay, they don't have to pay. They let you stay for free? I have had situations where we have won by offering more possession than somebody else who has a higher offer, but is being a jerk and saying, you have to be out right at closing. So again, make sure your agent is having those conversations. Those conversations are very important. Next up on the list is escalation clauses. Now this is one of the most popular things to do. It's all over the internet. If you Google escalation clause real estate, you will find all sorts of information about how to do this, how it works. I love using these things, but some agents are starting to say that they will not allow them, which I mean, can be good and bad. So the way an escalation clause works is you are saying that you agree to pay X amount of dollars over any verified offer not to exceed whatever your cap is. The benefit to this is you can start low or lower than what you your actual max of what you'd like to pay, and then you just sort of kick it up a little bit over any verified offer. So the way you're gonna wanna word an escalation clause is, buyer agrees to pay whatever dollar amount, $1,000 over any verified offer, not to exceed, and then you have your cap amount. These things can be great if you're just up against a few other offers. But the downside is, is you're not coming in strong right off the bat. So sometimes it's more beneficial to just start out by just going full bore ahead and just going right to your cap instead of incrementally increasing your offer. Cause then you're like, I'm interested, but you know, like a little bit. Now for that, this is that's varying degrees of risk. I know on my risk scale, I didn't say it right off the bat, but it depends on how much you're gonna go. If you're gonna do a $5,000 escalation clause, that's, that's a little riskier than doing a $1,000 escalation clause. Some people have said, well, can I do $100? That's more than any, no. You're not gonna do $100, you're not gonna do 500. Not enough. It might help, but that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you're just like, I'll give you 100 bucks more. I mean, on a $500,000 house, $100 is not going to tip the scales in your favor. If it does, it's a ridiculous situation. Next up on our list is an appraisal guarantee. Now this would be, I would say, a four on the risk scale. So any financed offer, we're not talking about cash deals. Cash typically does not have a third party appraisal. Now any finance deal will have a third party appraisal where somebody comes out to say, this is how much we think the house is worth. Now that's just one person's opinion of the value, but that person's opinion of the value is going to stick with your mortgage. So with an appraisal guarantee, you're saying that if the appraisal comes in under what you have agreed to pay, you will pay a certain amount or the full thing, the gap, you're going to guarantee it cash out of your pocket to make your offer stronger. You can do a fixed amount like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, I think you get the point, you, know, you just pick a number, you say like that's the amount, or you do a full, you just say, We'll pay it, I don't care. Whatever it takes, we want the house. This is money that's extra, aside from your down payment, so you have to take that into account when you're planning all this stuff out. So here's an example. 
house is listed for 500,000. You offer 550,000. So there may be a $50,000 gap in between what the bank says it's worth and what you've offered. Maybe not, I mean, maybe it was priced low and you know, your real estate agent should investigate all of that stuff, but there might be a gap there. A lot of times offering crazy high amounts is sort of pointless if there's no guarantee to pay a, an amount in between. When I say that offering more doesn't always win because sometimes it's just ridiculous. If a house is 500,000 and somebody says, I'll pay you a million, well that's crazy because the bank's not gonna loan you a million dollars for a $500,000 house. Not a chance. So anyways, you might have a $50,000 gap there. So saying we will pay 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 over whatever the appraisal comes in at goes a long way. Now this is exactly why a lot of times cash offers win because there's not an appraisal. Pay for it in cash. Cash, so. cash doesn't always win and the highest offer does not always win. And the reason cash doesn't always win is a lot of times those are investors buying. And a lot of times the investors want to pay a little bit less, but they can close faster and there is no appraisal. So this is how you're going to write an appraisal guarantee into your offer. Buyer agrees to pay X amount of dollars over appraised value not to exceed offer price. That's what you want it to say. Because if you have a $30,000 guarantee, you don't want it to go above what you originally said that you would pay. You want it to stop at your final offer price. Next up on our list is waiving inspections. I know it sounds crazy. People are doing it all the time. And I would put this at a five on the risk scale. Risky, very risky. Because I'm not a home inspector and there's a good chance your real estate agent is not a home inspector. But it's been helping a ton of buyers win deals right now because things happen after the inspection and people don't want to deal with it. Many, 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 many deals fall apart because of the inspection. Too many, too many, too many, too many. It happens all the time. So if you say, we're not going to have an inspection, a lot of times the sellers will go, thumbs up, we'll take your offer. Especially if the seller has to buy another house after they're selling this one and they just don't want to deal with any of that. They have to deal with your home inspection and your appraisal. And we've already talked about the appraisal part. So the more you can remove, the more roadblocks you can remove, the better chances your offer has standing out, winning. If you do plan to do something like this, waiving the inspection, I would suggest you take the money that you would have spent on a home inspection and buy a comprehensive home warranty. American Home Shield and a few other companies out there offer these things. They're about 600 bucks, 600 or so, and they cover a lot of the things inside the house. So like your appliances, your major systems, your interior plumbing, your electrical, things like that. So it covers a lot of, it does not cover your roof. It doesn't cover your plumbing line out to the street. So those are going to be sort of mysteries. If you find mold in the attic, not gonna cover that, but it's gonna cover a lot of the other things inside the house. So if you do this, protect yourself in that way. Little side note here, a lot of cities in Michigan, and I assume throughout the United States, have mandatory city inspections. Now these are not as comprehensive as a private home inspection, but they're pretty good and they catch a lot of things. So find out if the city has a mandatory city inspection and if you can see a copy of it if it's been done, because that might cover a lot of the things that you're worried about right off the bat. Next up on our list is love letters. Now these are super popular. Everyone seems to be like, can I write a love letter? Yeah, you can. This is a love letter, not a lottery ticket. Actually, sometimes they're not allowed, but you should if you really, 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 truly love the house. So I'd put this at like a two on the risk scale. It's not very risky, but it doesn't always work and the sellers don't always see them. If you're up against one other offer, maybe two other offers and they're, they're really similar and they're trying to figure out which one to take, they may read it, they may see it, they may fall in love with you, your family, and decide to take your offer. But a lot of times, if there's 20, 30, 40 offers on a house, they might not even see it. I mean, there's so many documents that go along with offers, they might not get to it. They just look at 
the price, the terms, and then they're not even gonna get to the bottom of the stack where your love letter is. So if you are going to write one of these, do not copy and paste one of the templates that you find. If you Google write a letter to seller to buy home and you find all these templates out there, don't just copy and paste those. We have seen them. I see them all the time and I can tell when they're not genuine. So be genuine about your offer. And don't list all of the things that you want to do to the house. Don't say, we love your home so much, but we're planning on tearing out all of your terrible wallpaper and knocking down all your walls. They don't wanna hear that. They wanna hear that you love the house as is, and you're planning on staying there forever, and you're never going to change a thing. They will cry if you tell them that you're gonna do all those things to the house. Stop crying. Stop crying. Maybe they won't cry, but I I'd cry. Do not try to come in super low because you see a bunch of work in a house and then just try to slip in a love letter hoping that that is going to carry the weight of all of the other things that you didn't include in your offer. I see that happen a lot. Buyers will write offers on my property and they'll say like, well, we love it so much and we want to change so many things and we can see our future here, but this offer is for $20,000 under asking. No, not gonna take your offer. That's a ridiculous offer. Don't care about your letter, I'm gonna set it on fire. All right, so next we're gonna talk about expiration dates. Everyone loves to ask me about expiration dates. Paul, when is our offer going to expire? How long is our offer good for? So this is about a three on the risk scale. And the reason for that is they can sort of work for you and they can work against you. In a non-competitive situation, expiration dates actually work better. So if there's not a bunch of activity on the house, if you don't have about 10 offers on a property, these things can work to make a seller make a quick decision. If you followed all of the tips that I've listed so far, if you offered over asking, you gave a guarantee, you did all of the things, you're waiving the inspection, you wrote a love letter, you're like, I love your house so much, it's where I wanna spend the rest of my days. And then you say, but my offer is only good until tomorrow at five o'clock and then I'm done with it. Doesn't sound like a very serious offer to me, right? So I'm like, okay, well you love it, but you don't really love it. Do you mean you love me like you love me, love me? You like it, you kinda like it. So most agents are gonna call your bluff on that. If you wrote a two page love letter and included pictures of your family and your dog, uh, and then you said it's going to expire tomorrow, most agents are gonna say, you're lying. If I call you two days from now and I say, do you want the house? You're gonna say yes, that's just how it goes. Now some newer and experienced agents, they will sometimes not know that. They'll say, oh my God, this offer, it's going to expire tomorrow at five. We need to take it right away. All right, so now for the little tiny tricks, the, the feathers that can break the camel's back. You know, we've all heard that, right? So this is when your offer is neck and neck with another offer. You've got 20 offers and you are in the top two. Little things that can tip the scales in your favor to win a multiple offer situation. First thing, use a local trusted lender. And sometimes you might even want to reach out to the seller's agent and find out what lender they prefer to use. Have your real estate agent do that. Just say, hey, is there somebody you would like us to get pre-approved with to make sure that we are good to go? That doesn't mean you have to use that lender, but sometimes it makes a seller feel better. So if all things are equal in two offers and you are using a bank like Chase or Bank of America or Quicken, one of the big lenders, and another offer is the exact same offer, but they're using a local lender that's easy to get a hold of, days, nights, weekends, sort of any time, and they can verify things quickly, the other offer will win. We just, we don't really like working with the larger banks because they're harder to get a hold of. They're less responsive. You just sort of get mixed around. And a lot of deals fall apart with those big lenders because they don't do the checks right away that they should be doing where a lot of times the smaller lenders do. The next thing you can do is pick a good agent. I am a real estate agent. I can help you buy and sell real estate. This is not a commercial for myself, but I'll tell you that if you pick a real estate agent who's pushy and obnoxious with you, there's a good chance they have a reputation for being pushy and obnoxious out in our field. And a lot of times, Agents don't like to work with those agents. A lot of times they do some shady things, like they'll get an offer accepted and then they come back a day later after inspection and they want a $50,000 reduction and they do it every single time. And when they're known for doing things like that, 
we don't want to work with them. I can't work with garbage like this. So if your offer is the same as another offer, and you are working with a pushy agent, there's a good chance if somebody knows about that agent, they will not work with you and that offer. The next thing you can do is put a big deposit down or big EMD, so that's earnest money deposit. Putting that up front and showing that you've got money, you're putting it down, you're, it's being held in escrow, sometimes goes a long way. It just shows that you actually have the money for the deposit or for the guarantee. So if you offered something like a $20,000 guarantee on your offer, and your earnest money deposit check is $20,000, that's a big deal. Like that, that shows me that you're not just messing around. Like you have the money and you are qualified and ready to buy. That's what we want. We just want people to buy the houses. We want our sellers to actually get their money. We want everybody to be happy. Like that is the name of the game. Kumbaya. The next thing you can do, and you should always, 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 always have your real estate agent do is to ask to be a backup offer in the event that you do not get the home. I have won so many of these by just asking to be the backup. So a lot of times when you have these highly competitive situations, buyer's remorse sets in for the winning bid. Sometimes they went crazy high, like insanely high, and then they're like, ugh, I feel sick. You know, like I didn't want to go that high, but they won it, right? So they they won the deal, but now they don't feel good about it. And so then they decide to back out of the deal completely. They say like, you know what? I don't want it anymore. So if you have been nice throughout the entire thing and you say, hey, you know, I would like to be the backup offer, you can win it. The seller's agent could contact your buyer's agent and say, you know what? Hey, another guy pulled out. These are the reasons. Would you like to still purchase a property? And sometimes you might not even have been the number two offer and they still come to you because you've done a lot of this other stuff. You did the right things. You had a good solid offer. So they wanna work with you and not somebody else. So what do you think? I hope that this helps you out. I hope that you win the home of your dreams by using some of my tips and tricks. If you have any questions, reach out. I can always help you out. And if you're looking to buy or sell in the state of Michigan, I can definitely help you out because I am a full-time real estate agent. So go ahead and check out some of these other videos and playlists around here, and I will see you there.